the land of the two mosques. I actually had the opportunity to travel here a couple years ago and get a slight taste of the city and countryside. There's so much information that goes in this video and it cannot be easily covered. So I'll try my best. Saudi Arabia. It's time to learn geography. No! Hey everybody, I'm your host Barbs. When I say Saudi Arabia, most people think of two things, Islam and oil. I mean, this kind of is the place where Islam originated. Oh, and what's that? Yeah, you can get a Geography Now t-shirt or a Geography Now gym sack or a Geography Now mug at geographynow.com. It's not selling out if it's my brand. Also, as you know, this episode was filmed during COVID-19 pandemic times. So for the time being, obviously everything will be filmed in my office. Caleb and Jillian are my tenants. They live with me. So obviously they can be in these videos because they live with me. Art is my closest neighbor. He lives within walking distance. So he'll be a regular. And with every guest host, we're going to film in separate time slots so that we're not all crowded in one place at once. Thank you. And with that, let's just jump into it. Saudi. Arabia. Oh, this episode is gonna be big. All right, so Saudi Arabia has actually had a lot of regional and sectional divisions based off of tribes and clans and former empires. I mean, there was even a point in time when their east coast was like ruled by pirates. <laughs> just wait for my episode. In any case, let's go to the globe. Saudi Arabia sits on the Arabian Peninsula in the Middle East, the largest peninsula in the world, and in itself is the 12th largest country in land area at over 2 million square kilometers. The country is bordered by seven other countries, and keep in mind, they also have the King Fahd Causeway, which connects them to little Bahrain, so technically eight countries. The country is further divided into 13 regions with the capital of Riyadh located fairly close to the south center of the country. Riyadh is the largest city and the second largest in the Arab world after Cairo with over 7 million people. It also has the second busiest airport, King Khaled International. The busiest airport, however, belongs to the second largest city, Jeddah, in the west with King Abdulaziz International and they also have the largest shipping port as well. The second largest shipping port belongs to the King Abdulaziz port in the city of Adamam in the east side close to Bahrain. Now, although Mecca, the third largest city, is an important place as the holiest city in Islam, they do not have an airport as they believe the city should be left free of air traffic and planes should not fly above it. Therefore, people wishing to go there usually fly to Jeddah and then take short land transport. The country has a vast road network extending to all other neighboring countries and four main rail lines connecting Riyadh to the east and north, with another separate rail line connecting Medina to Mecca in the west. Today, plans for a transnational railway known as the Saudi Land Bridge are underway, as well as the GCC railway along the Persian Gulf, which is supposed to connect them with the other countries along the Gulf, like Kuwait and the UAE. However, progress is kind of slow. In addition, the country has about 1,300 or so smaller islands and islets off their coasts. About 89% of them are in the Red Sea and the remaining 11% in the Persian Gulf, but Arabs will tell you it's the Arabian Gulf. Not gonna get into that. Anyway, of these islands, the largest is Farasan, with its archipelago in the south, close to Yemen. There was at one time a dispute with Egypt over the Sanafir islands right at the entrance to the Gulf of Aqaba. In 2016, however, Egypt's House Committee and Parliament approved of the transfer of the islands, which kind of angered a lot of people in the Egyptian public, but it still went through. In any case, the move went forward and plans to build a Saudi Egypt causeway are underway, which would officially connect the two countries for the first time since Ottoman Empire years. Key fact to note, the area of modern day Saudi Arabia formerly consisted of three main distinct regions. The Hejaz in the west, where about 35% of the population lives, the Najd with about 28%, and Eastern Arabia, Arabia or Al Asa with about 15%. On top of that, Saudi Arabia takes their maritime trading routes very seriously as about like a fifth of the entire world's oil shipping lanes pass through the incredibly narrow 21 mile wide Strait of Hormuz. We've talked about this before and it can get pretty intense considering who's on the other side. It's like, hey, hey, hey. dude, you're in my boundary zone. You're in my buffer. Don't yeah. Anyway, back to the civil layout. Saudi Arabia is structured in a unique way that very few other countries can kind of emulate. For one, they are the cornerstone and epicenter of the Islamic faith, holding the two most important sites in Islam, Mecca and Medina. You must be Muslim to enter Mecca. Authorities either check your passports for the religion label if it has one, or they ask you to recite the Shahada or the Muslim creed. If you don't know anything about these cities, basically, Medina is the burial site of the Islamic prophet Muhammad, and Mecca is not only his birthplace, but it also holds the holiest site in all of Islam, the Kaaba, which is this cube-shaped building in the center of the Great Mosque of Mecca, the largest mosque in the world. It is the duty of every able-bodied and financially capable Muslim in the world to make a pilgrimage here at least once in their life, otherwise known as the Hajj. And Saudi Arabia actually holds quotas for each country with the amount of pilgrims that are allowed to visit every year. What about the countries they have strained relations with? Yep, even those. No Muslim is denied, regardless of sect or nationhood. The reason for the restriction is because every year, it's like more and more people try to come 
come and it gets very packed and often dangerous in which incidents have occurred in which people have died from like stampedes and crushings in the past few decades. In Saudi Arabia's defense though, it's really hard to maintain crowd control when your city has to suddenly accommodate three times its own population. For what it's worth though, the newly appointed crown prince has issued a mass array of social and economic reforms that the otherwise previous legislation was a little weary of implementing. This includes the ever so sensitive topic of foreign investment and tourism. But ultimately, you know, it was kind of like, uh, maybe we should just focus on religious tourism from Mecca and Medina. How much did we make last year? Over 10 billion. Oh, Really? Yes. How are non-Muslim visa applications looking? Those have been going up too, especially in Jeddah and Riyadh. I mean, 10 billion from just Muslims alone? I mean, okay, I need a guinea pig. Hey, Emirates, how are you handling things? <laughs> I am having so much fun. People are coming from all over the world to have fun with me. Interesting. And that's basically how they granted their first tourist visas in 2018. Prior to that, the country only allowed non-Muslim visitors to come in if they had a business visa and if a Saudi national sponsored them, which is what I had to do back in 2015. I remember the process took forever. It was like a month. But now the country is like, eh, hey, yeah, come on in. Just uh, stay away from Mecca, but come on in. Anyhow, <laughs> Jeddah is also set to complete the new world's tallest building. <laughs> Don't even think about it. I got another trick up my sleeve. Anyway, with Saudi Arabia, you'll see a bunch of other impressive feats of engineering. Art, tell the viewers what they could witness and the sights they could see when they go to Saudi Arabia. You get to win a free car and some dates. The yellow ones are really good. Yeah. Metajewel. <laughs> Nah, but for real, besides the obvious Mecca and Medina, there's actually a lot of really cool things going on in Saudi Arabia, like sightseeing wise. For one, they have the largest water fountain in Jeddah, the world's largest desalinization plant, and soon the world's largest hotel is about to be built. They even have the world's largest burger restaurant. It's called, wait for it, I'm hungry. I'm hungry right now, actually, Paul. Yes, uh, we'll feed you soon. Okay, you have the D. Ein Marble Village, Musmik Fort, check out historic Diria, the Rajal Alma, or the famous Saad ibn Saud Palace, the King Abdulaziz Center of World Culture, the Floating Mosque, and there's that really mysterious looking cool rock that looks like it was cut by a laser, and nobody knows how it got that way. Aliens. Bob Saget. And probably the most famous yet very widely unheard of to outsiders, Madain Salah in Al Ula. It's Saudi Arabia's first UNESCO heritage site. Oh, okay. But, oh, you, you know. sold a t-shirt. Did you yeah, hear that, guys? I sold a t-shirt. You should buy one, too. At geographynow.com. Also impressive, the landscape. Let's go there now. Puh. Now we all know on the surface, Saudi Arabia is quite the dry country. Even looking at it from space, you're like, yeah, lots of beige and brown sand and rocks. But you know, if you look closer, you know, the desert has a lot of different types of cool sands and rocks. It's more fascinating than you think. First of all, the country sits on its own entire tectonic plate known as the Arabian plate. The rifts on the edges of this plate are essentially what form the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf, as well as the Anatolian Highlands and the Zagros Mountains in Iran. The country is primarily characterized by the Arabian desert, the fifth largest in the world and the largest in Asia. It makes up about 90% of the land and is roughly broken into three separate sand deserts and two rocky highland deserts. The three sand deserts are the an Nafud in the north, the Andana in the east, and the Rub al Khali in the south, which is the world's largest continuous sand desert. And it also has the highest sand dune in the world, Ramlat Jidila, at about 455 meters. These deserts shield the central Nejd Highlands as well as the Hejaz mountain chain in the west. The southwestern section of the Hejaz mountains, known as the Tihama, are the most lush and green areas of Saudi Arabia. This is where the majority of Saudi Arabia's agriculture sector can be found as the climate and mountains collect more moisture influenced by the jet streams carried by the monsoons from the Indian Ocean. Some of them even have snow caps in the winter seasons, like the tallest peak of the country, which is also in this region, Jabal Sada, at about 3,000 meters tall. The interesting thing though is that Saudi Arabia is officially the largest country in the world without any permanent rivers. They do, however, have wadis or seasonal riverbeds that flow on occasion and dry up in the warmer parts of the year. The longest wadi being Wadi Al Ruma in the next plateau flowing from Jibal al Abayad or the White Mountain near Medina all the way to Buraida. For other water sources though, the country does have quite a few oases speckled throughout the deserts, the largest one being the Al Hasa Oasis in the east by the town of Al Hofuf, further fed by the twins, the larger one Lake Asfar and Lake Hubail, the largest lakes in the country. Finally, it's important to note that the flatter eastern section of the country is rich in hydrocarbon resources and it is essentially the economic backbone that props up much of the country's export revenue. 
new sector. Going back to the southern green stuff, yeah, seriously, you'd almost assume it was like another planet with pristine spectacles of life amidst the granite and sandstone outcroppings. These are some really cool clips from my homegirl Ava, who is a travel YouTuber. Check out her channel. Whew, all right, now it is time for my triple shot of espresso break, which means now Noah takes over for the rest of the segment. Well, this thing does work. Huh, it'll do. Here we are once again at my humble abode. Now, of course, Saudi Arabia has lots of sand and rocks, but a lot of the sand and rocks are like, you know, structured in a really cool way. For example, you have natural sites like this crater in this wadi, which is sometimes called the Grand Canyon of Saudi Arabia. And in the center of the country, you can find the edge of the world. In addition, the country has an abundance of hidden caves and chambers known as dolls. Saudi Arabia is the largest economy in the Middle East and is considered an energy superpower. They are one of the top 20 economies in the world. They have the fifth largest natural gas reserve and the second largest proven petroleum reserves at about 260 billion barrels. This of course makes them the largest petroleum exporter in the world as well. This means with the heavy supply at their disposal, fuel is very cheap here. It's actually cheaper than water. No joke. Lips are getting a bit dry again. A little water. These reserves account for about 90% of their budget revenues and export earnings and about 42% of their overall GDP, mostly managed by the country's largest and state-owned company, Saudi Aramco. Anyway, off that topic, they also have about a dozen... <clears throat> Man. <laughs> voice cracked. They also have about a dozen or so nature reserves and protected areas throughout the country where you are most likely to find the desert wildlife. And with that, here's our animal correspondent, Gary Harlow. It's Gary Harlow. He's back. For Saudi Arabia, certain places make great habitats for bird species like buzzards, quail, the sand grouse, pelicans, and storks. Otherwise, the Hejaz are home to the various mammal species like the Arabian red fox, the fennec, sand cats, striped hyenas, and the highly endangered Arabian wolf and Arabian leopard. In fact, my accent's changing. <laughs> also, the iconic mammal of many Arabian countries, the Arabian Oryx was hunted to extinction but later reintroduced through a breeding program in Phoenix, Arizona. Since then, Arabian ostriches and gazelles have also been reintroduced as well. Oh, and one more last thing. Saudi Arabia has the world's largest camel market and the funny thing is, many of their camels are actually imported from Australia. Right, that means that I'm out. Back to you, Noah. Thanks. Gary. And with that, we finish off this segment like we always do. You know what's coming. Are you ready for it? Food! Saudi Arabia follows pretty much the same general Middle Eastern format when it comes to food. You know, you'll see a lot of hummus and skewered meat on rice. But for what it's worth, here are some of the specialties you guys, the Saudi jogger peeps, mentioned. Mofata, Salig, Areka, Masub, various types of mandi, Murtabak, Turid, Kursan, Dagabis, and what many consider the national dish, Kabsa, which can have a variety of meats, but chicken and camel are popular. Also, also, in almost every household you will find cardamom coffee. It has a very distinct cardamom smell and it is usually served with dates as an appetizer before any meal. And speaking of traditions, that brings us to the next segment, the... Thank you, Noah. So, all right, if the Arab world was a family, you know, Egypt would be like the popular athlete actor guy with a lot of connections. Iraq would be the wise old man that has a little PTSD. Oman is like the happy mom that everyone loves that just made you dinner. Qatar is like the black sheep who doesn't care what anyone thinks of him. Kuwait is like the classy rich cheerleader with straight A's. Bahrain is like the slightly tipsy partying rich cheerleader. Calm down, Bahrain, I'm joking, I'm joking. But I mean, come on, everybody kind of knows your reputation within the Arab world. We all know it. Any <laughs> Saudi Arabia and its people are well known throughout the world. We'll break it down in a bit, but first, the graph. Saudi Arabia has about 35 million people and over half of the population is under 25 years old and about 80% of the country is urban. The country is about 90% Arab in ethnicity and background and 10% other groups, mostly from Africa and Asia. However, it's important to note that numbers and statistics often may conflict from varying sources, but the average general estimation is that actual Saudi citizens in themselves only make up about 60% of the country and the remaining 40% are expats from a Abroad. The largest groups of expats coming from countries like India, Pakistan, Syria, Bangladesh, and the Philippines, and a small community of about 100,000 Westerners, mostly from Europe and the Americas. Saudi Arabia uses the Saudi Rial as their currency. They use the types A, B, G, and F plug outlets, and they drive on the right side of the road. The official language, of course, is Arabic, and it is also the original language of the Quran, and thus it is considered the only pure and trusted form of the Quran to be written in. Keep in mind, English is also widely spoken in Saudi Arabia. I mean, the 
British did kind of play a big role in their history. Former colony? Former protectorate, not colony. Now, if you're gonna address the social structure of Saudi Arabia, it kind of boils down to two main groups that run the show. The royal family and the Al Sheikh family. In the shortest way I can summarize it, the royal family kind of runs the government and the Al Sheikh family kind of facilitates religion as the country is a theocracy. To put it simply, the House of Saud is the largest royal family on earth with an estimated number around 20,000-ish members. They're spread across all the regions, but most of the power and influence lies in about 2,000 of them. And they are all descendants of Muhammad ibn Saud, the founder of the Saud dynasty back in the 18th century. The House of Saud didn't officially take over until the 1930s though. Prior to that, they had two other eras of control and it kind of went down like this. Let's seal an alliance by having our kids marry each other and let's join forces to control the area. Yeah! Oh no you don't! Also, fun fact, I'm gonna cut off your head and throw it into the Bosphorus Strait. I'm gonna finish what my great-grandfather started and control the emirate of Nejd. Oh no you don't! Rashidis will rule forever! I'm only 27 years old and I'm gonna take back my family's kingdom with only 60 men and I'm gonna unify Najd with Hejaz. Oh, oh shit, that actually worked. And whoa, there's oil here. I want to unify all Arabs and I believe the oil in Saudi Arabia should belong to all Arabs. Whoa, 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 I didn't sign up for that. Yeah, Egypt had a lot of interesting ideas back in the 60s. Anyway, for religion, the Wahhabi religious movement within Sunni Islam has been described with debate as the prominent feature of Saudi culture. I'm not here to eviscerate the inner doctrinal complexity of Wahhabi, or as locals call it, Salafi doctrine, but basically adherents claim that it is very fundamentalist, conservative, and Puritan. Somewhere around 75 to 85% of the country are Sunni Muslims, and 10 to 15 are mostly Shia living in the east and south borders by Yemen. All citizens are required to be Muslim, and all open practice of other religions of any kind are restricted. Keep in mind, non-Muslims do live in Saudi Arabia, like, you know, they got a lot of Filipino expats that are Christian or Hindus from India, but you know, everything has to be kind of like discreet. Like authorities won't arrest you if you say you're not Muslim and you can even kind of like openly talk about your beliefs But things like you know building places of worship and selling publishing and distributing religious texts Those are all per forbidden. This is where the episode is gonna go in the non sugarcoating direction, isn't it? We all saw this coming because the country has a standard of religious reputation to uphold like other Islamic theocratic nations There are many laws and rules in the country Although not always strictly enforced that have heavy regulations and punishments for acts that many people from outside might not be able to wrap their head around. They'd be like, why is that punishable? For example, anything that is deemed too immodest is generally frowned upon. I mean, in stores, you'll see like models with their bodies and faces blacked out. Freedom of press and speech are restricted to some extent, especially if it's criticizing the royal family. Pretty much all drugs are forbidden except for cigarettes. Alcohol is prohibited, but everybody kind of knows a guy where they can get some. The internet is heavily restricted, although everybody just kind of gets VPN servers to bypass this. And theoretically, based on the law, apostasy from Islam can be punishable by death if the individual refuses to recant. And probably the most controversial one, there are virtually no LGBT rights in the country. And again, theoretically based off of the law, homosexuality can also be punishable by death given the circumstance. I asked you guys, the Saudi geography peeps, what your thoughts were on this. And more or less, you kind of said something along the lines of, there isn't any active persecution or witch hunt. Capital punishment incidents are far and wide in between and rarely enacted. None Nonetheless, the LGBT lifestyle is just not something that can be compromised within Islamic doctrine if you claim to be a Muslim. Keyword, if you claim to be a Muslim. This is also kind of why Saudi Arabia claims to have an incredibly low crime rate, because I mean, you know, people are probably less inclined to commit an act if they know that the, there's going to be severe repercussions. But yeah, anyway, bouncing off of that topic, after the hydrocarbon industry, Saudi Arabia prospers a lot from the service sector driven by expats. And with that, uh, here's Art to explain. If you rub it more than three times, that's playing with it. Your wish is my command. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, Mark. Why you gotta go there? <laughs> I might leave that in the video. As we already mentioned in the Qatar episode, Saudi Arabia is another country that has the often criticized kafala system. We won't get too much into it, but basically the entire legal resident status of a migrant falls within the jurisdiction of the employer. Almost all construction, maintenance, and blue collar services are done by expats. Nonetheless, to ensure revenue circulates back to their own state, the Ministry of Labor and Social Development issued the Nitakat policy in 2011. This policy 
policy requires Saudi private sector firms to meet specific employment quotas for Saudi nationals over expats. Companies that fail to hire enough Saudi nationals risk losing government contracts. This has been quite frustrating for certain businesses as most Saudis are unwilling to take service and manual labor jobs and are often not educated in technical jobs that are usually assigned to expats. Sometimes companies just bite the bullet and it's like, okay, are you Saudi? Yes. Why do you want the job? Eh. Can you do the job? Probably not. Can you at least show up? If I feel like it. <sighs> Shit. You're hired. On top of that, there are no income taxes in Saudi Arabia, but they do give 10% of their salary monthly for pension plans. Thank you, Art. And finally, one issue that seems to be misconstrued a lot, the role of women in Saudi Arabia. I don't know, Hannah, you're a woman. You take this part. Uh, Hannah, explain, what's the women's situation in Saudi Arabia right now? Oh, well, let me tell you. Well, for one, unlike before, no, women do not need the approval or permission of a man to get permits, certificates, paperwork, or for travel. And yes, since 2017, women now have the right to drive cars. Saudi women also for the first time took part in the Olympics. No, they are not required to wear jobs and you will see uncovered heads. The women actually outnumber men in enrollment in universities up to 60%. So overall, things are changing. Nonetheless, in public, sometimes you will see gender specific segregation for men and then a different part for women and children. Thank you, Hannah, we'll get back to you in a second. Nonetheless, there's also social benefits like free Medicare and free education if you get accepted into a university. So it's weird, it's kind of like a heavily religious land with somewhat austere limiting policies polished with a shiny tech-laden exterior. That's basically Saudi Arabia today. Anyway, whew, I've been talking for a while. It's time to take another triple shot of this muscle break. And with that, here's Culture Stuff with Random Hannah. <laughs> Saudi Arabia is essentially the cradle of Arabism, and it goes back a millennia. Prior to the rise of Islam in the 7th century, the entire peninsula was subject to a multitude of Arab tribes, clans, and smaller kingdoms. Originally, Arab clans practiced various forms of paganism and polytheistic beliefs before Islam. These ancient kingdoms and civilizations influenced a set of folklore, legends, and tradition, like the legend of Ali Baba and 40 Thieves, Sinbad the Sailor, and yes, even Aladdin. There's a ton of scary legendary creatures like the Nasnas -nas that has only half a body, Bent Al Harsa whose lips are sewn shut, she tickles men to death. That is terrifying. Poetry is taken very seriously and is a national pastime. They even have poetry competitions on TV with prizes of over a million dollars. What? I'm the poetry champ. I should get in on this. Paul, am I, am I needed for the episode anymore? No, Ian, you can go. Traditional architecture varies by region and is based on what resources were available at the time. For example, the Nejd region, you will find thick mud brick box shaped homes with wooden beams and a communal courtyard. Otherwise, in the Jazz region, more sandstone and wood is used in buildings. As mentioned, women normally wear abayas, which come in black and also other colors. Men can often be found wearing thobes with a gatra and a gal on their heads. If it gets cold, they might add a bish to it. And when they hear a sassy comment, they might respond with bish, please. Marriages are often heavily orchestrated by families. Arranged isn't really the best word because actually adults can reject each other if they want, but but family involvement is key. Otherwise, some very popular pastimes include things like falconry, camel racing, and sidewalk skiing. And finally, festivals and celebrations are abundant. You have Gargion, in which kids dress in traditional clothes and go door to door asking for treats. Their national day is the 23rd of September, which is a big celebration with fireworks and skyscrapers light up with green and lots of music and dancing can be heard. Which brings us to... Keith, the rivalry continues. So just so you guys know, Rush is my favorite band. I've probably said about this about 10,000 million times. That's my commentary, don't sue. In Saudi Arabia, let alone the Arab world, music has always been an integral part of their culture. Each region kind of has their own specialty, but the most popular one considered the national dance would be the Al Arda, done with swords and drums. It's pretty cool looking. Otherwise, Saudi Arabia has a thriving kind of contemporary music scene-ish. EDM, there's some metal bands. It always kind of teeters on the edge of is it okay with the government or not? So for instance, like Al Namrud, they're a black metal band out of Saudi Arabia, um, but they have to live a life in secrecy because due to the lyrical content and for the music, basically, they can't be known who they are or whatever. The, their musical is punishable. How much more black metal can you get than that? <laughs> 
You also have the female of the all-female band, The Accolades. So as you can imagine, it's a very controversial band. The band's first single, Pinocchio, has become an underground hit with a quarter million downloads from the group's page on MySpace. I totally forgot about MySpace. I wonder where Tom is now. Do you guys remember Tom? That's all I got you guys today. Thank you, Keith. And now it's time for the briefly condensed history and famous people segment. Neolithic period, animal domestication, Ubaid period, pre-Islamic kingdoms, rise of Islam, Rashidun Caliphate, Umayyad Caliphate, Abbasid Caliphate, Fatimid Caliphate, splits off into tribal traditional rule in the Sharif of Mecca, clashes with the Persians, Ottoman rule, the first and second states of Saudi rule, unification and establishment of the kingdom, oil discovered, Gulf War tension, Cold War with Iran, 2030 vision, and here we are today. For famous people, I'm just gonna briefly summarize it. Pretty much all the former kings and some of the royal family members, these actors, these football slash soccer players, these singers, and some notable Saudi females include these people as well. All right, and with that, let's find out who Saudi Arabia interacts with across the world. Friend zone, go. Now, Saudi Arabia is a country everybody is paying attention to. So naturally, they play a big important geopolitical role on the world stage. For one, in a sense, all Arabic speaking countries and Muslim majority countries have some kind of tie to Saudi Arabia. Indonesia and Pakistan are probably the closest allies in Asia. Pakistan is often called the closest non-Arab ally as they have shared bilateral relations since the country's inception in 1947. Since then, they've shared military alliances. Saudi Arabia has invested heavily in Pakistan's infrastructure. They even funded the construction of the biggest mosque in Pakistan, which they named after King Faisal. Pakistanis can easily obtain business permits in Saudi Arabia, and Pakistanis provide assistance in the fields of technology and science. They even decreed a week-long mourning period when King Fahd passed away in 2005. Indonesia is important as they are the largest Muslim nation on earth, population-wise, and have the largest number quota of pilgrims for Hajj every year. Trade is crucial between them, especially in the petroleum industry, and today there are over 1 million Indonesian expats living in Saudi Arabia. The USA and UK UK are probably the closest Western allies, as Saudi Arabia was once a protectorate of the UK that worked side by side against the Ottoman Empire. Today, over 200 joint ventures exist between them, worth billions, and over 30,000 British nationals live and work in the country. The USA was also one of the first countries to recognize them after the Saudi family took over, and US President Franklin Roosevelt personally even met the king to establish future relations. Today, the two countries have a mutual defense agreement that involves operations and training for the Saudi military. Trade is huge between the two, and many Saudi national study abroad in the USA or the UK, especially members of the royal family. Tensions were a little strained after the 9-11 attacks, in which it was revealed that 15 of the 19 hijackers were Saudi nationals. And even though Saudi Arabia publicly denounced the act and stripped the Taliban members of their Saudi citizenship, including Osama bin Laden, as well as helping against the fight against terrorism, the stigma slightly stuck to the American public. Nonetheless, relations are still relatively strong today. Jordan is kind of like the sidekick of Saudi Arabia. The two get along very well. At first, it was a little tense though because you know Saudis were kind of responsible for ending the Hashemite kingdom's rule over the Hejaz region but that's not really an issue they bring up anymore when it comes to their best friends however most Saudis I've talked to have said probably their fellow GCC countries the Emirates Bahrain and Kuwait Kuwait has a heartfelt place in the minds of Saudis they protected the house of Saud when they're in exile from the Rashid dynasty and Saudi Arabia gave refuge to some of the Kuwaiti royal family during the Gulf War and they participated in the fighting against Saddam's Iraqi forces from taking over Bahrain as we mentioned is basically Saudi Arabia's hot girlfriend that he absolutely loves to visit and party with. Bahrain is essentially where Saudis go to get away from the strict life of being a Saudi. The two have had virtually no controversies. The royal families love visiting each other and they have cooperated on almost every single diplomatic measure since each country's beginning. The UAE is the fun brother that, like Bahrain, they love to hang with. Saudi Arabia also kind of likes to observe the UAE like an experiment so they can take notes on which practices they can implement in their own social structure for future development. Development. For what it's worth though, when a Saudi and Emirati or Bahraini meet, they don't even feel a sense of nationhood, they just feel a welcomed kinship. Oh, and of course, everyone loves Oman, can't forget about them. Oman is like the loving grandma nobody disrespects. In conclusion, Saudi Arabia is today faced with a unique situation in which they kind of have to find a way to like coalesce Islam and Arab tradition with advancements and ideas that sometimes bring a little bit of a challenge to Islam and Arab tradition. They are a Quran wrapped in steel and concrete, covered in a bisht, hidden in the ancient sands of the 21st century. Stay tuned, Senegal is coming up next.